Exploring Chiropractic, Episode 48, Diversity in Chiropractic with Drs. Fauché and Warnicky. Welcome back to Exploring Chiropractic. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Cashin. And in this episode, uh, I bring two guests who are members of the American Chiropractic Association's Commission on Diversity, which was convened uh, just about a year and a half ago to spread awareness and begin to make some changes within the profession with regards to diversity. We discuss what diversity is, all the different components and aspects of it, and how it will affect the profession and the individual chiropractor in the future. Dr. William Fauché is the chair of the Chiropractic Association's Commission on Diversity, and he's a 2017 graduate of Northwestern Health Sciences University. He practices in Dallas, Texas, and his goal is to positively impact culturally competent delivery of chiropractic care, both locally and nationally. And my other guest, Dr. Rebecca Warnicke, is in her second year of practice just outside of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Prior to graduating from Palmer College, Dr. Warnicke completed an eight-month clerkship at the Martinsburg VA Medical Center in West Virginia, where she provided chiropractic care to veterans working in an interdisciplinary environment alongside primary care physicians. She's an active member of both the American Chiropractic Association and the Mission Michigan Association of Chiropractors. And for the ECA, she is a member of the Commission on Diversity and Quality Assurance and Accountability. Hope you enjoy this interview with Drs. Fauché and Warnicky. So thank you guys for doing this. Um, after seeing a, a couple posts and reading about it, I was like, huh, this is actually pretty important. And it's something I don't know enough about. So part of the reason I'm doing this is so that I can learn more and understand it better, but also to get the word out and to clarify um, some myths and some misconceptions about it. Um, so as I mentioned in the notes, I always like to get to know you guys a little bit better. So Rebecca, when you were a little kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Yeah, so my background is a little bit unique. Um, I'm definitely the stereotypical Cairo kid. Um, I was actually adjusted for the first time when I was five days old, and I've oh. been adjusted literally my entire life. Um, there are almost nine chiropractors in my family now. So growing up, I think I just had a very different perspective than most. You know, I, I thought everyone got adjusted all of the time. I, I didn't know any better. Um, and I think I was about six or seven when I told my father for the first time that I really wanted to be a chiropractor just like him. Um, I, I grew up being in his clinic on weekends, after school, um, after seeing so many amazing things at a young age, I, I just knew very early on that it's what I wanted to do. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that really isn't the, the normal <laughs> path into chiropractic. <laughs> There's a lot of people like, uh, uh, that come from those big chiropractic families. Um, and sometimes they don't want to be a chiropractor. Mm -hmm. I find that interesting. Yeah, I almost fell off from it um, in college, actually. Uh, I think I was, I think I was a sophomore in college at Iowa State when I first thought, okay, science is definitely my thing. Human anatomy and physiology is definitely my thing. And then I, I started to kind of question um, what avenue of healthcare I wanted to take. Um, to make a long story short, my dad actually had a brain aneurysm, so I've always been really fascinated with neurology in general. So I thought, you know, maybe I want to be a neurosurgeon. Maybe I want to have some other type of uh, avenue when it comes to healthcare. And I, I kind of dabbled for about a year and a half. Um, but once I got to shadowing um, pretty much every provider you can think of, it really just drew me right back to chiropractic, which I think is important that I had both experiences. Um, mm -hmm. It really taught me, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I choosing this profession? Is it for me? Is it for my future patients? Is it only because I come from a chiropractic family? Um, so I really got to learn to the core, you know, why I was going into the field that I was going in. Have you taken, or do you have any interest in taking any of the neuro, the neurology courses like from Carrick or functional neurology seminars? Yeah. So I've definitely thought about it. Um, I think when you're fresh out of school, you're kind of trying to decide which 
which one is going to be most beneficial to you in practice. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think currently where I am and where I'm working, it doesn't make sense at this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, But that doesn't ever stop me from, you know, reading as much as I can online and, you know, studying up on articles. And um, obviously we learn every single day, but I think down the road, I would love some extra education. Um, If I could be in school forever, I would. (laughs) Um, So down the road, who knows, but definitely some interest there. Yeah, that's how I feel too. So Dr. William Fauché, when you were a little kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? You know, my mom was a nurse. And so I, I always felt like I wanted to be a doctor. And, you know, I took the long route to become a chiropractor. You know, I was a, uh, an adult learner. I took a gap between high school and college. And um, whenever I decided to do something uh, more significant, um, you know, I still wanted to be a doctor, but the truth is the type of doctor that I wanted to be had really changed. My life was, you know, I had one of those chiropractic uh, conversion stories, you know, Um, someone changed my life with, um, you know, a couple of simple adjustments and, um, you know, eight years later, there I am. Interesting. So this is a second career for you. That's right. Do you want to share what you were doing before that? Well, of course, you know, I realized as soon as I said that's right that there was a follow up. You know, that I could just uh, kind of <laughs> give you a little more information. <laughs> so, my first career was uh, working in um, hospitality. So, my last couple of jobs okay. were administrative management. So, my last position was a vice president of operations and field support. And before that, I was an operations manager and special projects managers and that those sorts of positions um but it wasn't very fulfilling at all and um, mm. um you know i graduated a couple of years ago and i'm uh, starting a practice now and i'm really getting kind of excited about leveraging some of my other experiences um you know to really have a, a fruitful and enjoyable career very cool very cool well we we're doing this interview um because it came across my radar that the ACA has formed a um, a new committee is committee a commission I think is the proper term on diversity and so this is a topic that's becoming uh, I've I've kind of seen it bubble up a few times here and there in different places so diversity is becoming oh it's always been but it's really coming to the forefront of important discussions to have and uh, reach out to you too so that we can discuss this so. How did this come about and and why is diversity so important in the chiropractic profession? So I'll jump in. Um, so, you know, I think that, that diversity is uh, extraordinarily important for the chiropractic profession now because in the regular medical marketplace, reimbursements are um, more accessible for uh, consumers to see uh, physiotherapists uh, in place of chiropractors. And in my connections uh, with folks who uh, have uh, backgrounds in public health, uh, in the effort to uh, increase our capacity to uh, have access to NIH funding, um, we have to be able to demonstrate a more robust um, aptitude for serving a broad, a much broader swath of the American public, which as you know, is projected to become, a, you know, um, white Americans are projected to become a minority around 2050. And so, you know, if we don't get a grip on this now, what happens is a diminishing um, white American public um, with a, you know, a, a diminishing chiropractic workforce, um, you know, will will essentially um, not necessarily serve a purpose if we don't really acclimate ourselves in uh, diverse, um, in, in diversity care and in um, initiatives that that really improve inclusion. Yeah, Dr. And Warren, you, go ahead. I was just going to add to that. You know, I love the way this is already this conversation has already started because um, a lot of people have a misunderstanding as to what the purpose of this group is. But um, Dr. Fauché hit it right on the head. I mean, this is to increase patient access to chiropractic care. Um, you know, in the Palmer Gallup poll back in 2015, only about 14 percent of the U.S. population um, is seeking chiropractic care annually. Um, There's a lot more people out there. And the reality is not everyone is a Caucasian middle-aged male. Um, You know, we have Hispanic populations, we have Asian populations, we have um, obviously females, and we have people of different socioeconomic status and um, genders and sexuality. And all of these people 
um, have health care needs, right? Low back pain does not discriminate. And if for some reason we have a barrier um, that is not allowing us to reach these people, our profession is really going to struggle. So let's let's clarify exactly what diversity is, because we've mentioned a few different aspects. Um, certainly, there's there's a race. So we talked about uh, the the race, ethnicity, color of America is changing. A lot of states are already nearing that. Uh, Caucasians being a minority, mm-hmm. um, and you touched on some others. So uh, the LGBTQ uh, community um, certainly women can be, you know, considered a a minority in a lot of ways. What other aspects of diversity should we keep in mind as we keep going through this conversation? Personally, one of my favorites uh, to talk about and to really try to understand is socioeconomic status. Um, Mm. It's one that really gets forgotten in the realm of diversity quite often, but Um, There are dramatic differences between those on the lower end of that scale versus the higher end in terms of their education, in terms of their access to health care, in terms of equality for a number of different things. And um, there should really be no reason why someone who makes $25,000 a year and has low back pain can't get the same kind of treatment as someone who makes $200,000 a year and also has simple low back pain that a chiropractor could take very good care of. Um, so that for me is one that's very heavy on my heart because it, it's, it really is the forgotten, uh, the forgotten part of diversity in my opinion. Yeah, I completely agree. Especially when we step outside of, of the USA, um, mm-hmm. I've mentioned many Absolutely. times on the podcast, I'm involved with world spine care and that's kind of the, the key goal of that is to bring spine care to people in underserviced areas. Oh, yeah. uh, Dr. Fauché, any other things, any aspects of diversity you'd like to add? Sure. So, you know, there are the, the standard protected classes, you know, age, um, you know, sex. But in the United States, uh, there are really no protections for um, uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. There's no sort of systematic protections. And so oftentimes, um, you know, even in, in, medical environments and including chiropractic um, practices, you know, we don't have the best practices at inclusion. Now, because uh, I happen to, you know, be in the LGBT community, it, you know, it rings true for me um, a little differently, but there are some other things that are really, um, really kind of affecting my perspective on diversity over the past year, as I've done uh, more work with the Diversity Commission, one of those is how it is we, um, you know, advocate for and um, make ready our services to folks who have differing levels of ability. And so I don't just mean like mobile disability. I mean, are we equipped to deal with patients who are are um, nonverbal or deaf? And um, you know, do we have linguistic competency? Um, and another big thing that's kind of, kind of uh, on my radar these days is, you know, there's the big push in the regular, like non-chiropractic diversity realm to talk about things like um, nutrition in terms of like food deserts and how it is that folks um, where they live might impact their capacity to be able to access services and fresh foods. And I think the same thing happens for chiropractic. You know, we're not putting our offices in a zip code where uh, you know, the majority of students are on free or reduced lunch. And so those are a couple of things that, that have popped up on my radar uh, with more significance over the past year. And I wanted to make sure I said something about them because they're such a big deal. You know, um, even those little minor things, you know, like, like, do we have one or two steps going up into our offices, um, you know, makes it sometimes uh, impossible for not just a person with mobility challenges, but just a, you know, average run of the mill person with low back pain. Um, you know, it's tough for them to get in. It does make it a challenge. Um, how do we, as we talk about this, and as I think uh, of some other conversations I've listened to, uh, there seems to be the possibility, and I think a lot of people have the concern that when we discuss diversity, we can become uh, so nuanced and start to pick out all of these different subcultures. Um, and so I'll throw myself in there because I was listening to the Women Chiropractors podcast. And as they were talking about all these challenges that, you know, that a, 
a female chiropractor who's had some kids and is trying to get back into practice, I realize it's not about just women. I mean, stay at home dads like myself, mm-hmm. right? Experience mm-hmm. a lot of the same issues, but I don't know that I want to throw stay at home dads out there as a minority <laughs> population that's, you know, that's being oppressed and that type. So <laughs> I guess I'm just curious, like, can we get too minute on, on these cultures and how do we maintain the big picture without diluting this idea of diversity? I like to personally believe that one person's oppression or one person's minority group is not better nor worse, no, nor more important than another. So to be honest, as a stay at home dad, you're going to face some challenges, right? You're going to face some awesome benefits to that too. And the same thing can be said, you know, for being a female, you know, as a female chiropractor, have I gone through some really unfortunate uh, situations because of my gender? 100%. Um, have I also had some pretty great experiences because I'm a female? Absolutely. Um, you know, any patient can choose to go to you because you're a man, choose to go to you because you're a woman. Um, so I think what I always try to remind myself is, you know, everyone's going to face some kind of battle um, because we're all so unique and different. Um, and all of us are going to face challenges too. But the second that, you know, people try to say, oh, well, my situation's worse. No, I'm, my situation's terrible. I think that's when we lose an appropriate stance on what diversity really is and what our goals should be. Um, you know, I, I personally, although I stand up for being a female in a male dominated profession, I recognize the fact that I can be, excuse me if this is inappropriate, but I can be just as good as any male chiropractor, right? I can do anything that a male chiropractor can do. I can side posture a 447 pound man, which I have done, right? It doesn't matter if I'm a female or, you know, five foot three and three quarters. (laughs) (laughs) So um, these are things that I... I just encourage people who are going through anything, you know, regarding diversity that's negatively affecting them. I encourage them to embrace that and use it as a motivator. You know, the fact that I'm a smaller female only encourages me to work harder. And when I'm 50 years old, am I still going to have, you know, some difficulty with being a female? Probably, but I'm, I'm prepared for that. Does that kind of make sense? Absolutely. And I I certainly have heard um, many stories where those obstacles became the strengths. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think of one of my uh, professors for adjusting technique was probably taller than me and definitely bigger than me. He used to (laughs) brag about his Gonstead pillow that he had developed from going to buffets all the time. (laughs) And so he had no trouble adjusting anyone. Mm -hmm. Um, But when you're in that situation, oftentimes become complacent. And so oftentimes, as you mentioned, smaller women become the best adjusters because they have to become much more technically skilled. Right. And I've seen, uh, certainly at the MPI uh, seminars that I took with, uh, I think it was Dr. Sarah Mackey, who is a very petite woman, but man, can she deliver <laughs> a good adjustment. Well, and just to kind of throw a short story out there, I... Um... As you already know, I, I did work. Um, I did my an internship clerkship at the at the VA on the East Coast, and um, I had the amazing opportunity to work under Dr. Sean Neff, who's currently the chiropractor at the Martinsburg VA in West Virginia. And I will never forget my first week there. You know, he started asking me what kinds of techniques I used, what things I feel comfortable with, and as I watched him adjust patients throughout the day, you know, very you know a, aggressive manual Gonstead type of type of approach, diversified he literally told me that I will be adjusting exactly like him. And I I flat out laughed at him. You know, here I am a student and I I laughed because I thought, oh, no, 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 no. Some of those things I just witnessed you do, there's no way someone like me can do that. And he told me to my face without a shadow of a doubt, you will do this. And it's because I had someone like that in my life tell me that, that I think I was able to become that. That's very cool. So before we lose Mm -hmm. the question for a second, I want to circle back around to um, what I think is a really uh, profoundly important uh, topic in terms of diversity. And it was, how do we, um, you know, assess and not become uh, overly um, critical or burdened by the variances in diverse uh, folks? And ultimately, 
the group of us who've been working on the ACA Diversity Commission have been uh, really working on, uh, you know, establishing some tools that chiropractors uh, can utilize to improve cultural agility. And that's a skill set that we're able to sort of apply to, you know, many types of individuals. And so it doesn't mean that you have to have, you know, specialized training on um, East African patients and specialized um, training for sub-Saharan patients, as much as, um, you know, having an improved skill set that just makes us more, you know, more capable. And, and I, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't lose that because um, I do get that question fairly often, you know, uh, how do I know I'm doing the wrong thing or the right thing? Or, you know, what happens if I get this wrong or, or, um, you know, those sorts of things. And they come up for us all the time. And um, I believe that the majority of of us really want to do the best thing for our patients. And we just don't want to get it wrong in a way that harms them or, or, you know, provides an additional barrier for them to access our care. So can you explain a little more what that cultural agility means? Um, I think I have an idea, but I'd like to get some clarity on that. Sure. So, you know, there are so many languages in the world, right? There's so many types of cultures that it's impossible for a chiropractor to, or any person to have, um, you know, a skill set that is relatable to each of those individual groups. So um, ultimately, you know, having the capacity to, uh, you know, serve folks where they are, find out how to meet their needs, not to put the burden of education on the patient. So if a patient comes in and they have a, a specific set of beliefs, or if they have a, a like, uh, one of my favorite examples um, is about intersectionality. So intersectionality is this idea that um, uh, it's really a, a topic that's most related to feminism, but it's this idea that, that uh, folks have multiple intersections of their identity. So for example, you know, I'm 42 and I'm a guy and I identify as queer and I'm a chiropractor and I'm all these things sort of all together. My favorite example of, you know, a marginalized person with a, a complex, um, with a, really a complex identity is this idea that, you know, say there's a woman who is a trans woman who has HIV and she's a sex worker and she goes to the doctor's office and she's treated poorly. So on the inside, is she treated poorly because she's a sex worker, because she has HIV, because she's transgender, because she's African-American, because she has housing insecurity. So those intersections of identity really are these, these things that Com that complicate our potential to be marginalized or or reduce our access to services. So cultural agility, Got it. I'm sorry. So cultural agility is is the capacity to sort of navigate in those things in a way that doesn't dehumanize the patient in particular, um, and really, you know, at the end of the day, none of us actually care how our folks live as long as you know they're getting better. Um, under our care and, um, you know, uh, you know, feeling safe in their lives. And so how do we as, as practitioners develop that cultural agility? Um, is it continuing education on cultural competency? Um, is it going to a different country and working on a mission trip? I mean, what are the ways that we can develop that skill set, which can be very difficult, especially if we grow up in a, you know, a very niche community and aren't exposed? I personally think it's a combination of everything. Uh, exposure and experiences are really, really crucial to developing your clinical skills and your interpersonal skills. Um, so obviously doing some kind of mission work is definitely going to give you those skills, but you know, it doesn't have to be just that, right? And what I love about what ACA is doing and about what this commission is doing is that our goal is to create materials so that doctors of chiropractic will have them readily available so they won't have to search very far. For example, if you know a patient walks through your office as a new patient and she's literally from a country you've never even heard of, <laughs> you can maybe guess it's in Africa. Um, and you can't just say, can you please hang on a second? I'm going to go to the computer and Google everything I can in 35 seconds, right? There's 
Right. That's not how we would naturally handle that situation. So I think it's important to educate doctors of chiropractic, especially on how we can get through that kind of situation without coming off as incompetent or afraid or worst case scenario, indifferent, right? Because even even if where we're from isn't of isn't something we're desperately looking to learn more about, we need to know how to best serve that patient. And that's going to include meeting them where, where they are at. Um, you know, I, I speak several languages, but very often I have patients that come in that do not speak one of the ones I know. <laughs> and I can't just pretend that I know that language. I can't tell them how great it is that I know Spanish when they're Russian, right? Mm -hmm. So I have, to, I have to find a way to make them feel comfortable um, if they do have a translator present, I have to find a way to not appear, again, incompetent or worrisome um, because they need to feel comfortable, right? If I, if I appear like I'm uncomfortable in that situation, how are they going to feel? So I feel like young doctors especially, or maybe doctors that have never been exposed, don't really know how to handle those kinds of situations if they've never dealt with them. So how great would it be to you know, in a sense, role play in school, or maybe go outside of the box and treat a patient in your student clinic who's a Muslim, or while you're in the student clinic, ask your clinic um, supervisor if you can spend a day shadowing a doctor in an outreach clinic so you can learn more about how to work with uh, Spanish, Spanish speaking people, or maybe those who are poverty stricken. So I think it's a lot of experience and exposure that, that really needs to happen. I think that's kind of a right on time sort of, uh, I, I love that you talked about, you know, the starting with the, the edge, you know, with, with our education. I think that, that, you know, uh, this is not the kind of thing like improving cultural competence for an entire profession, which by the way is behind many professions, but actually not behind many others, you know, um, we did a fair amount of research to determine sort of where chiropractic lands in comparison to other healthcare provider types. And there are some who knock it out of the park and there are some who just don't. And we're kind of uh, right in the middle. Um, and so we're really getting our feet wet and in and, and getting our feet wet, essentially what we're doing is, um, you know, we are affecting, uh, you know, public information. So public information as accessible through, um, you know, peer reviewed papers. There's like in the next couple of years, um, I know an, a, a fair number of folks who are working on papers um, for publication that are on broad topics of diversity. Um, the ACA just recently um, established a council on women's health. And the most amazing thing about that uh, was I had the benefit of uh, being at a conference speaking um, with Dr. Patroco Napoli. She's the um, council president. And she um, gave this reminder that women's health is not just pregnancy care. And I thought, oh, yeah, of course, you know, because that's, that's the extent of, um, you know, where I recognized my contribution to women's health in a chiropractic clinic. What a disservice. And, you know, I serve more women than men. And I was mm -hmm. really delighted to, uh, you know, to be able to hear her. And I think that, that uh, you know, those sorts of efforts, you know, uh, part of it is public information. Part of it is going back to our schools and our associated um, service providers and saying things like, hey, your intake forms are not inclusive. So, you know, meaningful use now says that you should ask about sexual orientation and gender identity. I mean, it's the law. It's not my opinion. It's what the government wants to know. So, um, you know, the majority of even university clinics don't really offer that. Um, and the last thing I want to say is uh, uh, our team on the diversity commission just this year uh, were assigned a two uh, student liaisons for SACA. So I think that's a really uh, fantastic thing because those folks will go back and be able to um, directly affect the diversity conversation for a couple of thousand students a year. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, having a, a platform like that uh, is a really good start for shifting the, the conversation on, on diversity. That's great. So, so can students get involved in this commission um, directly, 
or is is this a kind of a flow down um, process right now where the commission is going to be passing on information and resources to the, this to SACA? So essentially, the the two liaisons are creating their own uh, student led um, diversity initiatives. They will be in conjunction with our greater commission. Um, we have a couple, we have uh, both Dr. Warnicky and Dr. Peggy Chen, who is on our commission, um, have uh, expressed um, significant interest in working with the, the students to be able to um, affect their deliverables in a way that, that is useful to them and their uh, colleagues at their chiropractic programs. So, you know, I'm not sure what that will look like. And we are only like 15 months into having a diversity commission, even though it was in 2012 that there were a couple of papers published that said, hey, you chiropractic profession need to do this <laughs> thing. And so here we are doing it, you know, several years later. <laughs> <laughs> Things do move a little bit slow. So it's been 15 months. What are the what are the goals, short term and long term, for this commission on diversity? Let me let me let Dr. Warnicky talk on that for a moment, please. Sure. So I think because this was such a new thing that's never been done before. Um, you know, when you first start something, especially something of this great importance, we really had to start with the basics, right? We had to one establish the group. We had to um, create ourselves within a larger organization such as the ACA. And then we had to really nail down what it was that we wanted to do. So we started with the charter and then we started with the actual overall commission and setting our goals, both short term and long term. Um, and then now that we've actually established ourselves, you know, we've done a Facebook Live speaking to um, doctors of chiropractic, we've set up um, and emails have gone out from ACA you know, letting everyone know, hey, we exist, which is great. Um, now that we've actually created a platform and a foundation, now we're actually able to create some deliverables. So some of the really big short-term goals that we have are to literally just produce content, right? Again, that's where exposure comes into the picture. So creating things like blogs, which uh, Dr. Fauché has already gotten us started with, um, creating blog posts just to spark interest and spark some ideas and concepts um, among the profession and also creating things like infographics, explaining just what a tiny detail involving diversity, what that tiny detail can do for your profession. Uh, one of my favorite examples of that is that when a female over the age of roughly 45 to 50 comes into your office, we need to be talking to her about bone density, right? We need to be talking to her about, you know, her exercise and is she only doing pool therapy and aquatic therapy and cardio, or is she doing some kind of resistance training? Because guess what one of the top things uh, medically, medically wise among that population is osteoporosis, right? And that's not, that's one of many medical conditions that has a diversity component to it, right? In the Jewish community, there are diseases, um, Tay-Sachs disease, that's more common among, you know, African-American males. We have uh, children, obviously, we have the elderly population, we have the veteran population. So I think it's really important to educate those who maybe don't want to dive into diversity as much as Dr. Fauché and I do, but just to educate that one chiropractor can make a huge difference just by learning one little detail that we could potentially put out through this commission. That one little detail could help hundreds, if not thousands of people. So, you know, one thing that I think is super cool is just before we were getting ready for this conversation, I looked down at my phone and I had gotten an email from the ACA, and then as we uh, were getting ready to to get this conversation kicked off, um, you know, we noted that we had received um, uh, the link to a survey. So the ACA has randomized a, a few thousand uh, ACA members um, to take a, a short survey, and really the short survey is not about you know what do you think about this, and and you know. How are you that or any of those things? It's how can we help you better meet the needs of your patients? How are we able to better serve your practice? And um, what uh, types of uh, topics are interesting to you? Uh, and, and how should ACA deliver them? Or do we even have a responsibility to deliver them? And so, you know, it's a, a really fantastic survey. And the survey ultimately will guide our um our work for 2019. So all of us have been appointed through 2020. And so what we'll hope to do is, is take that information 
Um, our purpose is to inform the Board of Governors and the ACA staff on uh, topics related to diversity. And so we know that the survey will help us do that with um, a greater, de- you know, a greater degree of of authority, you know, the last thing that we want to do is show up and offer, you know, a ton of information that's not actually helpful for, you know, chiropractic doctors to be able to, you know, improve outcomes with their patients. The last thing I want to, I want to kind of make sure that that we acknowledge about this is that ACA is not the only chiropractic related organization that's doing good diversity work. So. Um, as I understand it, that currently the ICPA is um, working on their own brand of, uh, of uh, improved capacity for cultural competence among um, ICPA docs. And then, um, you know, just, uh, you know, there's a big conference, The Wave, that's held, uh, I guess, at Life West. And just last year, um, one of my favorite ACA folks, Dr. Keita Vanterpool, was there um, as a panelist um, hosted by one of my favorite um, LGBT chiropractors, Dr. Angel Ochoa Rea. And, and, you know, they have this great dialogue. And so, you know, this is surfacing in places beyond the ACA. And, you know, I feel really privileged to be able to serve ACA in this way because my personal values align in this way. But I would be doing this work, I think, even if I were not associated with ACA. So, Dr. Fauché, what are some examples of organizations that are um, bringing awareness to diversity? So, you know, there are a couple of, uh, in the United States, there are a couple of of, uh, small um, organizations, like there is a Latino Chiropractic Association. They're very much um, vitalistic in nature. There's a um, like a, an Asian American um, Chiropractic Association. And Dr. Um, Ochoa Ray has a small gathering of folks for an LGBT Chiropractic Association. Um, my favorite, uh, most the most active, um, the most active of them is the American Black Chiropractic Association. So the thing that I really love about the ABCA is that. Um, they really reach out to students. They do a lot to support students, um, not just to improve uh, the student experience um, in chiropractic colleges, but they actively serve the community from, uh, you know, that surrounds them. And, and, you know, one of, um, whenever we first convened the diversity commission, we had uh, two uh, for two folks who were in former leadership positions with the American Black Chiropractic Association. And, um, you know, and and one of the things that, that we found ultimately is that um, ABCA members go out and do really, really strong work in the community. Um, and I don't, you know, it, it, it seems to um, really be, um, you know, inspiring in a way that we had hoped to emulate their drive and impact as a commission. You know, I find them personally to be um, extraordinarily admirable as an organization and their leaders are just folks that I look up to. I'm gonna to try to find a link to that video of the of the diversity panel at The Wave. I came across that as I was researching this topic and I'm glad you mentioned uh, Dr. Angela Cherurea because he was actually my second interview on this podcast uh, when he was still at Life West. And I've been following him since, and, and he's built his practice um, around the LGBTQ community. Um, I noticed he recently changed the name, but it used to be called LG, LGBT um, Chiropractic, and now it's called Spectrum, which I like as well. Um, but, it, but it's interesting that this creates a lot of opportunities for chiropractors. And I was wondering if uh, Dr. Warnicke and Dr. Fauché, if you can talk a little bit more about what are the benefits to chiropractors if they really embrace diversity and and begin um, developing their cultural agility and and competency. What I personally love about it from a benefit standpoint is that it doesn't matter if you decide to dive into diversity 1% or 100%, it will automatically benefit others and it will automatically benefit you as the provider. Um, one, you're going to become a better provider because you're going to understand your patients better. You're going to be able to provide more positive um, environments and situations for your patients as well. Um, And the medical community has done a ton of research on this. 
looking at patient satisfaction rates and um, general patient comfort levels um, with their experiences with their medical providers. And every single study shows that they are more comfortable when they feel that they can relate to their doctor. They are more comfortable when they feel like their doctor understands and respects them and will listen to them. Right. Um, so when it comes to diversity, you know, if someone wants to talk to me about their um, religion, for example, and if it's something that I either know nothing about or perhaps it's different than my actual beliefs, I'm going to listen to that patient. Right. Um, that visit probably isn't going to turn into a visit about religion, but it's it's my position as a healthcare provider to make that patient feel comfortable. And if they want to say something that matters and means something to them, I'm going to let them say it. Um, and it's important that I continue to make that a comfortable experience for them. So I think another way it also benefits providers is you're going to increase your population base, right? And that, that's a pretty blunt way to put it, but you're going to get more patients by being better, more culturally competent, by being more well-versed in these kinds of things. Um, I know for me, the fact that I speak Spanish it really is a great avenue for me because those patients will feel more comfortable walking through my doors than someone else's. Um, even if I knew how to speak a couple sentences, that would benefit me. My fiance, for example, um, I'm always teaching him new sentences that he can use and his patients have been loving it. They immediately change their outlook. Um, he can tell them different ways to move during the adjustment. He can ask them where pain is. He can ask them where um, what they feel and what it means to them. And that's something that has really changed his relationships with patients. Imagine what that can do for thousands of doctors of chiropractic. So I think that alone is the biggest benefit that this can bring to doctors. It certainly brings humor into the conversation when you try <laughs> to use a new language. Yes. <laughs> this was a case when I was in uh, Haiti and trying to speak Haitian Creole. Um, oh. And yeah. It it certainly breaks the ice. Definitely. Um, Dr. Fauché, you mentioned a couple papers, which I'll link to down below, um, but I thought we just mentioned some of the, some of the key ideas. Um, we touched on this at the, at the very beginning of this conversation that, uh, that the nation is becoming diverse, um, that over the past, uh, looks like about 10 years, um, the, the racial diversity has gone from, uh, let's see if I can find the numbers here. Uh, I guess it's on a different page. But the number of uh, Caucasians is really going down. And as you said, in 2050 will be below, is projected to be below 50%. Um, and I, I don't know that we highlighted this, but the idea that minorities use chiropractic less than whites, and not just because they're minorities, the, the percentage uh, that they use chiropractic is much lower. Um, and so how, how would this benefit the profession as a whole by embracing diversity? What are your thoughts, Dr. Fouché? So, you know, there are... I guess we didn't we didn't really cover this uh, the th the three of us together before this, but there's um, <clears throat> there are some papers out there about uh, minority group utilization of chiropractic using Medicare and uh, Medicaid. I think that primarily those uh, studies have been uh, limited to African American individuals and Hispanic individuals, um, which are the two largest minority groups in the United States. So that would of course would make good sense. Um, and I think that, that when we, when we're looking at, um, you know, how it is that, that we're able to, to serve these folks, you know, it really comes back to, um, utilization. Um, it really is about, um, you know, getting folks in the door. The thing that we have to offer is, um, pretty fantastic. And some people don't like what we do and that's not, you know, that we won't change, right? Um, I did my uh, I did my internship training at a federally qualified health center in Minneapolis. I did, I did two federally qualified health centers in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, when I was in chiropractic college. So one of them was almost exclusively Spanish speaking, and um, my Spanish is rough. 
And I always make these jokes and I say, you know, I apologize now. I know like 150 words in Spanish. I don't know 150 words. I know many more. But, you know, like, like we laugh about it. And I'm going to tell you that what happened is um, consistently I would have someone come in and say, oh, my sister came here and saw you. So as a student, I learned that, um, you know, being able to serve uh, minority folks um, would have built my practice for me, which is exactly, you know, um, what I'm hoping for, you know, in my my new ventures in, in Dallas, Texas, where I'll be able to treat patients in Spanish. I had this, um, at one of the federally qualified health centers where I trained, um, there were uh, some, a fair number of Liberian refugees in, in that area. And, um, you know, there was a woman who came in and I knew just a little bit about Liberia. And we had, a, you know, like, you know how this goes, like, you know, I'm a student, so I had a whole hour with her for the intake. So, you know, we spent like three minutes catching up on what I know, and I asked like two questions, and we laughed. And then the next week, her daughter came, and then the next week, the son-in-law came. And like over and over, I've seen that happen, that when we uh, really kind of reach out and uh, make ourselves relatable, especially to, fo to folks who might feel uh, marginalized or, or are actually underserved or under underrepresented that you know it's it's a total practice it's a total practice builder so utilization rates go up um and you know and we're not having to do things like like go out and um, you know knock on doors and do mall screenings or whatever you know it's like like folks folks reach out to the people that they know so i belong to a number of lgbt um social media groups you know closed groups secret groups the whole deal right and people say things like, hey, does anyone know a trans inclusive provider in blank? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so yeah. like in Vermont, um, there's a, an LGBT resource or, or a resource for LGBT competent um, providers. And so you get yourself listed on there. It's no charge. And a, a trans person wants to know, hey, who's the best chiropractor to take care of me? And they look on there. You know, it's it's me and my colleague. Right. Because. Uh, um, you know, that's what we did. And, and I think that, that, uh, and this is a really long answer, but, uh, you know, ultimately it comes down to, you know, as we do good work that, um, really embraces, um, folks as they are, you know, it really does, um, impact not just like a person's individualized health or their family's health, but in, in my case, it has been like the health of their social network and social community. And I think that's the whole point, right? Absolutely. That's great. Well, I'd like to wrap it up. Uh, and just mentioning again, that one of the papers that you sent me and uh, I, I really like this quote that I pull from it, uh, which for me summarizes this quite well. Um, to be contributors to, to society is not necessarily enough to acknowledge that we each have a different way of interacting in the world. To be truly effective, we must understand and grow from the richness that others offer to the social fabric. Um, I've definitely experienced that as I've traveled the world with uh, World Spine Care and, and personally and with family, uh, living in Brazil, being in India, being in Haiti. Uh, there's a lot that we can learn from others that can enrich our lives. And uh, I guess in my mind, that's the greatest benefit that we can get from learning more about other cultures, other genders, races, uh, and all you know differences that we all share. Um, I'd like to have each of you share where uh, students can learn more, both about the ACA Commission on Diversity, but also you, if you'd like them to follow you. Uh, directly and share any final thoughts, Dr. Warnicke? Sure. So um, as a final thought, I just would like everyone to know whether you're a student or a doctor of chiropractic or um, a professor or even a patient. Um, what I want everyone to really understand is that you do not have to be a minority to want to get involved with this. Um, you do not have to be a minority to want to serve patients who are minorities. Um, I get questions all the time. You know, I'm a Caucasian 23-year-old male. What, why does this matter to me? Um, 
you know, if I don't want to get involved with the commission, you know, should I still learn these things for my future practice someday? And the answer is always yes. Um, you know, on our commission currently, we have people that come from all different kinds of backgrounds. If someone really wants to get involved, you can be anything you are and you can get involved. So that's, that's the biggest thing I really want to stress. Um, and then when it comes to getting in contact with us, Dr. Foshe and I are extremely reachable. Um, my email address, my personal is actually R followed by my last name, W A R N E C K E seven at gmail.com. Um, I'm completely open to anyone contacting me on my personal email. I'm very easy to find online as well. Um, Rebecca Warnicky. And then, um, as for the commission itself, if you're a student, I definitely recommend going through those amazing two student liaisons and uh, we can send you that information to post in your show notes as well for students who are interested in that. And talk to your colleges, talk to your universities. If you are interested in anything regarding these things, talk to someone in the clinic about how you can serve patients that are of minorities. Um, talk to your professors about when you're in clinic about how a side posture adjustment might change for someone of a different gender, race, um, religious status. You know, ask questions. That is what's going to get us further um, with this profession is asking questions and being willing to learn. I love that. Thank you. Dr. Fauché, mm -hmm. last thoughts? So, you know, there are some um, existing organizations. Uh, I'm glad that you talked uh, briefly about, uh, you know, what diversity looks like on a global scale. And so really what we've done is highlight what it is we, you know, we are kind of focusing on the United States. But I think it's really important to acknowledge the, the strong work that um, the World Federation of Chiropractic and that um, World Spine and Karen and, and the um, what is it, the World Congress of Chiropractic Students, those groups really reach, you know, um, folks who, uh, you know, otherwise would not really, uh, you know, get our care. And, and so I think that, uh, you know, acknowledging them is super important. I think that uh, not all students or not all folks who listen to this will, you know, necessarily be interested in, you know, ACA initiatives and, and uh, you know, like I totally embrace that. And Dr. Warnicke, um, I think that, that she would feel the same way. This is like, we embrace that. Our work um, at, at ACA is, you know, to support ACA members, right, um, in general. However, our ultimate priority is to improve public health. Our ultimate goal is to um, perhaps make a contribution to improving access for chiropractic patients to chiropractic doctors. And so uh, I'm really glad that you asked the question about how could we direct students to sort of plug in because you know ACA may not be your brand. And if your brand doesn't have a diversity plan, I think it's brilliant to ask about it. I think it's perfectly acceptable to um, make waves in your universities and in your programs um, about you know measures of inclusion and diversity um, and I think that um, that ultimately, um, student, you know, the the student perspective um, could perhaps be more important even than you know docs who've been practicing for some time because you know those folks who are in school now will you know be practicing for another thirty years when that happens that shift in in you know the American population and so I'm glad you asked about it um, I would do, I do want to plug myself for a second so um, I can be found um, easily with handles um, at uh, a mindful Cairo because I'm a little bit of a meditator it's a thing that um, has really uh, shaped and shifted my life and um, so it's a part of my identity in that um, intersectionality that we talked about that uh, I'm kind of most delighted by. So um, anyway, I think that's all I have. I'm really glad that you uh, invited us to come on and, and talk with you about what we're doing and what's what we think is important about this. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, it's yes, thank you. been educational for me, kind of stretched uh, my knowledge and understanding. Uh, and so I really hope that the listeners uh, have learn something from this and are encouraged to get involved and to just to become aware of the diversity around them. Um, and links to a lot of the things that we discuss will be in the show notes. So if you're listening on your mobile phone, just check the description of the podcast episode. Um, and you can always go to exploringchiropractic.com to find all the notes and links back to uh, Dr. Rebecca Warnicke and Dr. William Fauché. 
thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you once again for joining me on my Exploring Chiropractic podcast. I hope you enjoyed this discussion on diversity with Drs. Fauché and Warnicky. As always, I would greatly appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Just head to your podcast app and leave a review and four or five stars. You can follow me on social media by using the handle at Exploring Cairo on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and I think even TikTok. And one more thing, if you wouldn't mind receiving a very occasional email from me, I would appreciate it if you sign up for my email newsletter. Uh, just head on over to exploringchiropractic.com slash email or follow the link in the show notes. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next episode.